this morning, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we've typically done in the past. Um, typically, when we do our threefold communion services, we spend a portion of that time kind of teaching through what each of those different pieces are and then participating in them. Um, because we just ended Jonah, we felt like now would be a good time to try to switch that up a little bit. And what we're going to do is something uh, I don't think we've done before. We're going to spend time teaching through the pieces this morning in a little more detail with a little more information. And then we come together tonight. We're just going to allow Scripture to kind of guide us and direct us. And we're not going to spend as much time going over those different uh, pieces. Uh, the other thing that we're doing different is uh, Paul and I are both going to be sharing this morning. So I think the last time, I was joking with him, the last time we did this um, was the first time that we live streamed in March of 2020 because of the pandemic that had just started. Things were starting to close down. We did kind of like a round table up here with uh, Phil, who was in town with us. And so we kind of got our hands forced in. We kind of did like a round table discussion that morning. So this will be the first time that we get a chance to kind of do this kind of different way of, of sharing with you. So we're going to tag team this this morning. I'm going to start us off. We're going to talk about kind of what an ordinance is, what makes the Karis Fellowship distinct from some other groups. Um, and then we'll, I'll talk about the bread and the cup portion. And then Paul will come up and share with the other two pieces of our communion service. Uh, if you're new to the Gulf View Grace family, you may not be aware uh, that we're part of what's a larger family, which called the Karis Fellowship. We've talked about this somewhat before, especially if you were in our membership class recently. We've shared a little bit of this. Uh, the Karis Fellowship is comprised of leaders and churches, commonly known or previously known as Grace Brethren. They had changed their name a little bit ago to kind of um, better identify with the global movement that we are. Um, it traces its roots back to Germany in 1708, where a small group of sincere Christ followers committed to uh, forming a church that would be faithful to the teachings of the New Testament. Yet they recognized that their spiritual foundations and were built upon the broader work of godly men and women throughout history who have faithfully labored to interpret God's word. The Karis Fellowship is a national family made up of over 250 churches in North America. So we have some churches in the U.S., we have several in Canada as well. Um, and they share a common commitment to understanding God's word or biblical truth, those three kind of pieces at the bottom there. So a common understanding of biblical truth, living as the people of God, or what we call biblical relationships, and fulfilling the purposes of God or biblical mission. We are also part of a larger family um, called the, Car the Global Caris Alliance. So the Caris Fellowship, the North American branch, is a part of a larger group of churches, known as the Karis Alliance, with more than 3,000 churches in 25 countries. All of that to say that you are part of a much larger family of churches, uh, not just this one. And so we've talked about, we've had conversations with some people, and it's, it can be a little difficult to understand because we're not a denomination because we don't have this overarching structure, right, that kind of dictates things and puts people in places. So we are independent in that way, but we're not really independent, Right? We have other people that we partner with and are what we would call family because we have these shared beliefs and identities and that we work together. Um, this past Tuesday, Pastor Paul and I were just able to go to a, a local meeting of some of these pastors uh, from the different churches in Florida, from Ocala, Lakeland, Sebring, um, uh, the Fort Myers. There was a couple of different churches, it's about you know, 10 or so that were represented there. And that's only a portion of those who we have in Florida and we were spent, able to spend a couple hours together encouraging each other, building relationships with, the, with each other, and helping to support each other in our different ministry efforts. So as being part of a, a member of a wider family, we share what is called the Karis Commitment to Common Identity. This is a portion of the document which is typically referred to as your statement of faith. Um, that typically has you know, 10 to 12 points on it that you've looked at that has what do you believe about God, what do you believe about Jesus, those different things. We also have an expanded version of that that talks about some other things that, you, that the church has to buy into to be part of the family, if that makes sense. Um, this covers, again, we, things like the triune God, the Lord Jesus, humanity, salvation, and others, but also on this document are things that we together affirm, affirm as churches. There's a third section in this document um, Call, uh, talking about ordinances, and this is what it says. It says, we affirm that Jesus Christ gave ordinances to the church. Baptism testifies to the reality of our salvation and identifies us as disciples of the triune God. We therefore encourage the practice of triune 
immersion. If you've been baptized, if you've been to one of our baptisms, you kind of see that. These are some of the things that make us as part of the Karis Fellowship distinct from maybe some other groups that you may be familiar with. One of those things is baptism. The other thing that makes us distinct is our communion. Communion testifies to the justification, sanctification, and glorification, which are accomplished through Jesus Christ. If those words are new to you or confusing, don't worry, we're going to kind of parse out what those means and how each of the pieces of our communion service help us to understand those and help us to give a way to, to put action to those beliefs. We therefore encourage the practice of these symbols, the bread and the cup, the washing of feet, and the sharing of a meal. And so again, maybe if you're part of a different uh, faith tradition, these are a little bit different than what maybe you're familiar with, but we're going to explain what these are. And these all fall under a bigger category, which we call ordinances. It's another one of those theological terms that will help define. Um, an ordinance is a Christian rite associated with tangible elements, such as water, bread, and wine or juice, that is celebrated by the church of Jesus Christ. The term is closely associated with the word sacraments. Maybe you heard that word, and some use those terms interchangeably. Some have distinctives that they give to those different words, so don't get confused by that. But just so you know, there are some variations in that. These are an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace that we've been talking about. Another way to simplify this a little more as we're trying to get our heads around these different pieces is an ordinance is a physical, visual representation of something that has happened or will take place in the invisible spiritual realm. An ordinance is a physical, visible representation of something that has happened or will take place in the spiritual realm. This is what we talk about when we talk about things like baptism, right? We say baptism doesn't save you. You've already been saved. But baptism is an act that shows others that you are saved, right? It is a way to identify with Jesus and his church through this action that he's given us to show that inside you've been cleansed by Jesus. And so on the outside, we dunk you in water. Does that make sense? It's, it's pretty simple. And speaking of the importances of ordinances... There's a guy from our fellowship called David Plaster, and he says this in his book on ordinances. Man has, by his very nature, an incapacity either to receive or to express spiritual things independently of some sort of external media or instrument. So he needs something physical on the outside to express the internal spiritual invisible things. Ordinances are physical elements in a ceremony which God uses to communicate to his people important spiritual truths. Again, the way we practice these ordinances in our fellowship, both baptism and communion, um, are things that make our church, our, our fellowship, distinct from some others, because maybe some of these things are not things that you've heard of. Sometimes baptism, right, people will have sprinkling or they'll have immersion, but we do immersion where we dunk you three times versus one. And so there's just some of these distinctions there. Uh, and again, these are a physical outward representation of something spiritual that happens. It's an object lesson for you to help focus your mind on Christ and the things that he's commanded of us. Communion for us is a time of remembering the past, present, and future ministry of Jesus. And it is one of the two ordinances that we see given to us in Scripture in the church, in our faith tradition, communion is typically celebrated by three different acts that represent the three different pieces of Christ's ministry. We talked about these words previously, justification, sanctification, and glorification. The bread and the cup that we would typically take, the one that you're probably most familiar with, right? we feel represents Christ's justification. We'll define that term here in a minute. Right, but that's Jesus' past ministry. It represents his sacrificial death on the cross. That's what Christ has already done. The foot washing piece represents the present ministry of Jesus, or what we call sanctification. This is where God is slowly creating you and turning you into being exactly who he wants you to be. As you read his word, as you fellowship with his people, as you pray, and as you interact with the Holy Spirit, as it guides and directs your life, God is forming you and molding you into being more like Christ. That's sanctification. And last, we have um, our glorification. This is what we call the love feast, which represents the future ministry of Jesus, where everything that you were supposed to be is now made true, and you celebrate that with him.
Since we use the word renovation a lot in our church, um, because it's one of those words that kind of corresponds with our uh, mission statement, um, I thought maybe this analogy would be helpful for us. Uh, Again, there's more that could be said. There's a lot of information that's attached to these different pieces. So this is this is a sprinkling of some of what these things mean, but hopefully it helps us get a grasp on them as we get ready to celebrate this uh, tonight. Justification, again, happens at the point of salvation when someone accepts the gospel. They believe that Jesus has died on the cross and offers them forgiveness for their sins. Jesus has paid the debt that we owe to God through his substitutionary atonement, where his death on the cross is re- replaces our sin debt. Justification is like when you get the blueprints for your remodeling project. The project has been approved, and now the work can be, can be started on your house, right? Jesus has now purchased you and can begin the work of transforming your life. That's justification. This is symbolized again by the bread and the cup. Um, sanctification is where you begin to do the demolition, right? The old drywall comes out, the old floor comes out, those light fixtures get switched out, and then Jesus begins to put in the new things in your life um, that he needs to make you what he wants you to be. Uh, Ephesians 4 really captures this well. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, it says, You've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and its corruption through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is what foot washing represents. And when Paul, uh, Pastor Paul comes up, he'll explain the foot washing and this other piece in a little bit more detail, but we're just kind of getting us an overview as we begin. Lastly, we have glorification. The remodel is complete. Everything's been done. The punch list is now complete, and now you can move back into the house, right? Everything is done. All the work that Jesus has done in renovating your life has now come to a close, and Jesus' work of transforming your life into exactly what he wants to be has now been made complete. We are now with him, and we are celebrating this completed work. This future reality is anticipated through a mealtime as we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We get that in Revelation chapter 19. So justification, what Jesus has done in purchasing you through his death on the cross. Sanctification, what Jesus is doing as he cleans up your life and makes you look more like him. Glorification, the work is done, and now you're with Jesus in heaven. All three of these pieces then come together to form our communion celebration, a time of remembering all that Christ has done and anticipating all that he will do. Communion then is an opportunity for us to share in, again, tangible symbols that help us to represent our spiritual journey in Christ. They are concrete, actionable representations of all that has been purchased for us in Jesus. These spiritual truths are internalized and symbolized through these external physical actions that we get to partake in. God knew that his people needed these physical reminders, an action that we participate in to help us understand and communicate these spiritual truths. You see this all throughout the Old Testament specifically, right? You have things like the Passover, right? A way to remember what God has done at the Exodus. You get the, all these different feasts, those seven different holidays. Those are all actionable things that God gave to the people of Israel to help teach and remind them of the truths um, from his word. And God has given those to us as well. It's also important to note that communion um, is something that is reserved for those who have trusted in Christ. Jesus told us in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, to do this in remembrance of me. To do this in remembrance of me. To do in remembrance of him implies that you know and believe the truth that you are remembering, if that makes sense. Again, it's a physical, visible representation of something that has or will take place in the spiritual realm. If someone does not believe in Jesus, then it would not make sense to celebrate the things that they 
don't believe is true. So again, this is for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus as their sacrifice to remember things that have happened to them. These things, for those others, these things are not yet true. So then communion then is a time for God's people to celebrate and reminded of the past, present, and future ministry of Jesus. Um, there's good news, though. Even though this is reserved for Christians, there's literally still more room at the table, um, both physically tonight and lit- you know, metaphorically right in Christ. There's always more room at the table. This is uh, one of Jesus' parables in Luke, uh, Luke 14. He says, But say to them, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. All the servants said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done. And still there is room. And the master said to the servants, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. There's plenty of room at Jesus' table for you. All are welcome, but you must first accept the invitation. Now that we've kind of helped establish what an ordinance is and, and what these things are, and what they represent, we're going to spend some time talking about the different pieces of our communion service in a little bit more detail. Uh, again, I'm going to look at the bread and the cup piece of that, and then Pastor Paul will help us to understand the other two. All three of these pieces, these components, take place in the context of what is commonly called the Last Supper. That may be something you're familiar with. This is Jesus' last meal with his disciples before he is crucified the following day. Read this in Matthew 26, on sometime on Thursday, again before his crucifixion, Jesus instructs his disciples to go and prepare the Passover meal. He says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for, us, for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. We mentioned this a little bit before, but the Passover was celebrated annually in remembrance of Israel's exodus from Egypt under Moses' leadership. You can read this in Exodus 12 if you're not familiar with it. And this is the story of how God sends 10 plagues to the Egyptians as the Pharaoh refuses to let the Israelites go. When he finally does relent and release them from the slavery that he's held them in for 400 years, Pharaoh has a quick change of heart, and he desires instead to run them down and recapture the workforce that he's released. In another act of miraculous deliverance, God, through Moses, parts the Red Sea, and he allows the Israelites to travel across on dry land. And as the last person makes it to the other side, We see Pharaoh with his chariot charging down that same dry path. And as he's there, the wall of water gives way and destroys the pursuing Egyptian army. It was a time of remembering God's great deliverance of his people. In fact, the greatest deliverance of his people up until this moment. During the meal, Jesus had a pronouncement that they did not expect. Amongst them was one who would betray them. If only they knew who, how soon this betrayal would actually take place. It says in Matthew 26, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him after, uh, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him not to have been born. 
Then Judas, the one who betrayed him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. The meal then continues in this very somber and somewhat awkward tone as people are contemplating the news of this deserter amongst their ranks. While they are eating the Passover meal, Jesus did something amazing and unexpected. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said to them, Drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of of sins. Jesus here is introducing something new into the Passover feast. It was typical to have these items at Passover. It wasn't like they add like an extra loaf of bread just in case, and Jesus grabs another cup of wine because he's planning something. These are already things that are there. But Jesus takes them and he gives them new and special meaning. Instead of this time being one where we would remember God's deliverance of slavery from Egypt, they would now symbolize their deliverance from the power of sin. In place of a yearly sacrifice of an unblemished lamb, they would instead be a once-for-all sacrifice of a spotless lamb of God. The bread that we are going to break tonight represents Jesus' perfect sacrifice. If you look throughout the Bible, you see that leaven represents sin. And so tonight, the bread that we will have has no leaven in it. It's flat because it represents Jesus' sinless life. We see that his body was broken to pay for our sins, but it brought us into a restored relationship with the Father and each other. Jesus said that the bread was his body and that the wine was his blood of the new covenant. That's verse 28. During the Passover meal, uh, typically there would have been four cups that were used as part of that celebration. This cup that Jesus is taking is most likely the third of those four cups at the Passover, and it is the cup of blessing or the cup of redemption. Uh, there's a little excerpt here from Chosen People Ministries. This is a Messianic Jewish organization. These are people who are Jewish by heritage but have now believed in Jesus, their Messiah, and they kind of help us explain the importance of this third cup. The cup of redemption is the third cup of the Passover Seder and is the first cup to be drunk after the meal. It is believed that this is the cup of redemption that Jesus instituted, uh, instructed the disciples to partake in uh, during that Last Supper, since both accounts in Matthew 26 and Luke 22 describe the cup being taken after the meal. Luke's account, he refers to the last meal Jesus had with his disciples as the Passover in Luke 22. Again, in Luke 22, it says specifically that Jesus tells his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The cup of redemption traditionally signifies the slaying of the Passover lamb that spared the Israelites from the 10 plagues of the, and the 10th plague of the slaying of the firstborn. And so you see some of the tie-ins here. This corresponds to God's great promise in Exodus 6.6 6, where he says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Therefore, it's very poignant when Jesus tells his disciples that the wine uh, in this cup is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. As the blood of the Passover lamb covered the Israelites and the Egyptians back in Egypt, so the blood of Jesus covers all believers today. Matthew 26, 27, and 28 says, And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This cup foreshadows the shedding of Jesus' blood and the absorption of God's wrath, which opens the way for redemption for all people through this new covenant relationship with God. Unlike the old covenant, which required a continual sacrifice, this new covenant has only a singular sacrifice. Instead of a yearly sacrificial lamb, there is one perfect lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of all those who believe in him. One perfect sacrifice, remembered through the bread and the cup taken at communion. <clears throat> 
As we said at the beginning, the bread and the cup represents justification. Justification is sometimes explained as just as if you've never sinned. And although this can be a quick way of describing it, it's slightly unhelpful because it's not complete. Uh, It doesn't give a full meaning to the word. Justification has two primary components. Uh, First, justification is a legal declaration of innocence. In the court of God, our sins have been forgiven. We are, in fact, guilty of the crimes brought up against us. But through Jesus' sacrifice, we are declared innocent. But not only is our debt um, before God canceled, but our accounts have now been filled to an inexhaustible amount. Jesus not only took the penalty for your sins, but he also gave you his righteousness. God no longer sees our rebellion, our sin, or our mess when he looks at us, but instead he sees Jesus. This is what justification means. Through Jesus' shed blood, we have redemption that purchase out of slavery and blessing. God came in the form of Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. Hebrews 9.22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. As we kind of close up this section before we, Pastor Paul comes up, I just want to read you one other verse. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, both redemption and blessing. Um, thank you, Mark, Pastor Mark, for, uh, for sharing with us, and i um, grateful f- uh, so much for Mark. Um, so we're we're learning quite a bit. So this morning is more like a, probably more like a, a teaching time for us. And uh, like we had said this morning, we, we really have never done this before. Um, but we felt like instead of taking time out of tonight's schedule to do that, that we would do that together with our church family here. So Mark has begun our conversation kind of helping us to understand what an ordinance is, why an ordinance is important, and really why we should celebrate these ordinances. And we believe that Jesus has given these ordinances to us, to his church, that's who we are, and that these ordinances are are ceremonial in nature, Um, and you will see that tonight if you've never been a part of that, but that they also symbolize a spiritual reality that is expressly taught to each of us within Scripture. I would answer that call, that might be important. Um, Anyways, uh, so Mark led us first, uh, the first aspect of the threefold... uh, ordinance of communion. And we believe that, again, that celebrating uh, communion in this threefold way best pictures for us the spiritual realities of what these physical, tangible acts each represent. I believe that that God knows that we're forgetful people. And and Mark had kind of alluded to this, that all throughout Scripture, God gives us symbols. God gives us things to help his people remember. Because you and I are forgetful people, and that's just how it works. Um, And so we need reminders. There's something about holding something tangible in your hands that helps you, doesn't it? It helps you remember things. There's something about seeing a symbol that helps you and reminds you that you need to do something. When you see a check engine light on your dash... That, that is there to constantly remind you, if you don't do something quick, you're going to have some troubles soon. The American flag is another symbol that a lot of us are familiar with, um, and we can touch it, we can hold it, and we can watch it blow in the wind, and as we raise it, we look at the stars, and we look at the stripes, and each of those represent a, a bigger piece of the story, right? And so that's a symbol for us. The cross is probably one that we're most familiar with, and the symbol of the cross represents something than just a piece of wood, right? It's so much bigger and so much grander to us, um, and so we, we know that those are symbols. And so Mark took us through this first symbol, and that's the symbol of uh, the bread and the cup. And this is a real tangible symbol that, that you will be able to tonight to be able to hold in your hands you've never been a part of communion, hopefully you have been, especially if you're a follower of Jesus. This is something that, that we are told to do, and we're to, to, to do these things, to remember. Jesus himself says, do this in remembrance of me. 
And so tonight when we gather around the table, we're going to be able to hold a piece of bread and it's going to remind us of, of something. We're going to be able to hold a little tiny cup of grape juice, and that's going to remind us of something. And again, Mark went over those reminders of the past ministry of Jesus on the cross, and really all that His death on the cross has completed for each of us who've placed our faith and trust in Jesus. And we learned the first theological word that Mark took us through, right? The bread and cup is this theological word called justification. Thank you for the three of you who have been paying attention this morning. All right. So yes, that's the first theological word, and we'll continue to kind of bounce off of this. It's important for us when we talk about justification, justification does not make anyone holy. It simply declares him to not be guilty before God, all because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And so justification doesn't make you holy, but it declares that you are holy because of what Jesus has done on the cross. If you want another cool little reference, you can look at Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 9 through 11, it kind of takes you, it's a cool little resource that kind of helps you to understand a little bit more about justification. So we must not remember, or we, we must remember that we are not saved by our works because we're just not good enough. You and I are not good enough. This morning, I'm sure that there are some of you who had some, a nice friendly ride on the way to church with your spouse, right? You know how that goes, right? And so it's a little bit of argument, and so we all know that sin still lives within us. So we're not saved by our works. You can't earn your salvation. We're saved by His work, right? It's all about Him and the, and the work that Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, So again, we are not declared righteous because of anything that we've done. We're declared righteous because of all that Jesus has done. A cool little verse maybe you're um, uh, familiar with, um, and uh, I have no idea where we are. Hang on one second. I'm going to catch up here, and give me two seconds. There we go. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? Then it goes on, not of yourselves, right? It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I can't boast about how good I am in order to earn God's favor. That's why it's called grace. He's given that to us. And we have, an, we have a, a, a decision to make. We can receive that gift or not. And so this reminds us again that salvation comes from God. It all comes from God, not from us. We cannot earn it. We cannot boast about all of our good things and our good behaviors that we do. Bottom line, tonight, it's all because of Jesus. Where you and I stand today because of salvation, because of grace, because of mercy, it's not us. It's all because of Jesus. So this is the past ministry of Jesus in each of our lives for those of us who are believers in Jesus. So now we kind of transition to the next aspect of our threefold communion that we're going to call the present ministry of Jesus Christ in our lives. So first it was the bread and cup, and now we come to the present ministry, which is the symbol of foot washing. And foot washing is a symbol just like bread and cup is a a symbol. It means something greater than what it is, but we can actually feel it and touch it, and we can participate in something as this symbol to help remind us. And so these symbols and, and foot washing has this grand, tremendous spiritual significance in our life. Now, some of you who are not a part of our Golf View family, you might be thinking and you might be whispering to your neighbor, did he say foot washing? Did he say the washing of feet? No, no, no. I, I must be misunderstanding him. No, you're not, and you're hearing me just fine. And so I did say foot washing. Um, and so to repeat what Mark said, rem- reminding us that we're a part of a, of a bigger fellowship of churches. And within the Karis Fellowship, this has been something from the very, very beginning of our fellowship that we have been participating in, this, this threefold aspect of what communion is. And we believe it gives us the best complete picture of really what communion is all about. We believe that if you leave one of those out, you're just missing a little bit about what the full picture of communion is all about. And so we're going to go on this journey together, and we're going to continue to help ourselves understand it. We did some reading so far in some of the Gospels that Mark kind of took us through, looking at Jesus celebrating the Passover uh, with his disciples in the upper room, what we call the last Thank you. You're paying attention. Um, and I think to understand the context, like Marcus started for us, it's, 
it's important for us to wrap our heads around that. So I just kind of want you to get this picture that you are eating with Jesus, you're one of his disciples, and maybe we'll say there's 13 now, and he's included you, and we're around the table together, and we're, we're partaking in this last supper. And I think it's, again, helpful for us to get this in our mind as we get ready to dive in to see how foot washing plays. Pun intended, diving in, get it? Okay. Um, so the Last Supper is called the Last Supper because it's literally the last supper, right, that Jesus participated in while he was here on earth before he went to the cross. So this is important. This is some of Jesus' final words that he has this opportunity to share with his disciples. And I don't know about you, but whenever I'm around somebody who's nearing the end of their life, I want to hear every single word that they say. And so Jesus now is, is sharing with his disciples some very important things and this is like a, a poignant last meeting with his disciples whom he loves so dearly, and he begins to leave with them an object lesson. And I love this. So as he's sharing with him some of his final words before he takes his walk to the cross, he begins to share with them some object lessons. This is how Jesus works, right? He always had this beautiful way of taking advantage of every opportunity, didn't he, to teach his disciples on the run. So everywhere he was, a fig tree, right? He picked that off. And what about this? And, what? and so he would always use these different beautiful symbols, tangible things that they could grab onto to help them know what he's all about. And so just moments ago before his disciples gathered to sit around the table for the Last Supper, an argument erupted. So picture you're one of the 12 or let's say 13 because you're in there too, right? And um, you're just doing your things, what you're just doing life with what the disciples normally did. And the disciples... Um, should give us lots of hope because the disciples weren't always the, the best guys, right? Um, they had struggles just like you. They had temptations just like you. They mess it all up just like you. And so here the disciples are moments before they've gathered around the table, an argument begins to kind of fester within, within the 12 here. Um, and this basically, this argument that erupted um, was down to one question, who is the greatest? This, this was it. So this is like one of Jesus' most important moments of his life. He's nearing the cross. They've heard this. It still hasn't clicked maybe and totally in their mind. And what do they decide to do in this moment? They decide to argue amongst themselves who's the greatest, right? So you can imagine that you're one of those and you're having this little conversation arguing about who is the greatest and you now start to gather around the table. And I think this topic of choice to argue about helps us to grasp the fact that Jesus' disciples were young, they were still immature, they were still a work in progress, and to use words that we like, they were still renovating their life, right? Just like you and I. So they weren't perfect and we know that. They had a lot of growing up to do and they're a lot like us, so do we. And Jesus had just finished sharing with them this symbol of the bread and cup, and then he shares with them the fact that there is going to be one among them, as Mark had shared with us, who is going to betray him. And this created quite a disruption. Well, not me, not me, couldn't be me, not me, Jesus, no way, not me. I've been faithful to you the whole time, right? So this is all happening now. This is the disruption. Notice what Luke 22 um, uh, says. We'll skip these, I'm sorry. One more time. Luke 22. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. So here's, here's the argument. So they're talking about who's the greatest, and they're talking about who's the one in, in the group who's going to betray Jesus. He must be crazy. This can't be right, right? Um, and so the argument happens. Notice what John's account shares with us. Mark has shared Matthew's account with us. Here's Luke's account. Now notice a little bit of John's account in John chapter 13. We'll be looking at this further detail even tonight. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas that's the guy, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, in the middle of the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around 
around him. So picture this again. You're around the table. Jesus says that someone's going to betray him. Oh, it couldn't be you. It couldn't be me. And one by one, we begin to think about that. Suddenly, another disruption happens, and we're beginning to think again about who is the greatest among us? Which, by the way, is not the first time that the disciples had this challenge. They've thought this many times before. Jesus, remember that time, Jesus grabs a little child, right? Remember that little lesson? Again, Jesus always using symbols, always using visuals to help us get it because we're forgetful. And so the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest among them. Jesus, in the midst of all of this, quietly gets up from the meal. He takes a towel and he wraps it around his waist. You can kind of just picture the disciples still kind of arguing, and then all of a sudden it just gets softer and softer and softer, and they look up and they're like, what's Jesus doing? He's putting a towel around his waist in the middle of dinner. This doesn't happen. And then one by one, he begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, can you imagine... Just picture this in your mind. You're one of the 12. You're sitting around the table. All this has transpired. Jesus gets up, not saying a word, very quietly grabs a towel, puts it around his waist, and he begins to wash your feet. Then he moves to your neighbor's feet. Then he moves to the next, and, and then, and so on. Now, just minutes ago, the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, most faithful follower of Jesus and where we might sit when we arrive in heaven. I want to be right there. And so they're arguing about who's the greatest, and in the midst of all this, Jesus gets up who is the greatest, right? We know he's the greatest. He's worthy of our praise and our worship. And Jesus gets up, takes the position of a lowly servant, and he begins to wash your dirty feet. My guess is that this would be quite a humbling experience for you. Jesus says, I have not come to be served, but I have come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. If there was ever a time when that statement was more real in the lives of his followers, I believe it was probably that time. They're arguing they always want to be the best. They think it's about prestige and about power. And Jesus simply puts a towel on, kneels in front of them, and says it's not about that at all. And this was the heart of Jesus. The washing of feet was a task that was normally performed by the lowest, most menial slaves. Typically, it would have been performed at the door upon your arrival to the house. So you've been arrived, if you were invited to my house for for a supper, um, you would come and one of my workers would come and they would wash your feet. You know, we're, we're, we're living in, in these days in this first century where there are no paved roads and there are no Reebok or Nike shoes, right? You're wearing leather sandals and you've been walking all day long because you don't have a car. <laughs> and everywhere you walk, you're stirring up dirt and your feet begin to get dirty, and regardless of how clean you were, regardless of how many baths you may have taken that week, merely just walking outside, even for just a few moments, your feet would become dirty again. And this was a fact of life within the first century. But the time and the place for feet to be washed would again have been at your arrival at the house. Nobody would have washed your feet during supper time. Wouldn't that be strange? We just pause for a moment. Take off your socks, please. All right. It's just odd. It'd be weird in our culture, no doubt, and it definitely was strange in this first century culture as well. And so Jesus takes another opportunity, as Scripture says, while evening meal was in progress. That's what Scripture says, while the evening meal was in progress. And he takes this opportunity for another object lesson, another symbol to share during this Last Supper to help his disciples and to help you and I to understand something spiritually significant. Now, I believe that foot washing is, is, is complicated. I believe it has kind of a twofold meaning to it that's, that's accurate to look at these, this twofold dimension. One, and as the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, Jesus simply begins to wash their feet. And by, again, doing this simple act, Jesus is reminding them that true followers of Jesus are not identified by their power, 
True followers of Jesus are not identified by your prestige, but true followers of Jesus are those who are secure in the Father's love and are willing to serve, are willing to serve others. That's what true followers of Jesus should be doing. So this physical act of foot washing, I think, serves, again, twofold aspects, serves to remind us of the spiritual role and responsibility that we all have towards each other as a fellowship of believers. I should serve you. And there are moments, I'll be honest, I need you to serve me. I need you to pour into my life. And there are moments I know that you need me to pour into your life. And so I believe that humility and fellowship are part one of the object lesson that Jesus is sharing here that he's teaching us, but we must not miss part two. And part two, I think, underlines for us why we include as a fellowship of churches foot washing to be a part of this threefold aspect. Because number one, Jesus included it in his last supper, and so we too are going to include it within our last supper Remember, again, in the first century, regardless of how clean you were, regardless of how many baths you took, merely walking outside for a few moments, your feet would be stinky again. And just like foot washing represents the present ministry of Jesus in our lives in the forgiveness of our sins, we have a daily need in our lives to be forgiven and cleansed from our sins. And foot washing represents this daily need that you and I have within our life for this cleansing from the indwelling sin That's within our life. So notice what happens next when Jesus makes his way around the table, beginning one by one. You know this part of the story. We all love it. We all love Peter because I think a lot of times we're like Peter, right? Um, And so notice what takes place next. He came to Simon Peter. Maybe he's already done the first three or four before you, and he comes to you. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand No way, said Peter. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. I think we're now getting into this twofold aspect where this is not just humility, right? You're beginning to follow maybe what Jesus is talking about. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my my head as well. You might as well wash my whole body. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. Who would be the one? Judas, smart. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one was clean. Quick side note, you ever wonder what happened to Judas? This verse um, is one of many that tend to um, lead us in a direction on where we think Judas is today. I do not believe that that Judas had a saving faith in Jesus. It seems pretty obvious there. He may have had a faith, but his faith, he may have believed, but he did not have a saving faith in who Jesus Christ was. There were times in Judas' life where he even served Jesus, you could say. He was on the A-team, right? He was one of the 12. But yet he didn't have a saving knowledge. And the Bible is pretty clear that we don't believe that Judas is in heaven today. Back to this passage for a moment. After reading Jesus' words here um, in in these first few verses, it's, it's very apparent that Jesus, again, is not just talking about humility. That's part of it. It's part of the twofold. But there's, there's a bigger part of the object lesson. He's talking about something greater, and he uses foot washing to be the symbol of choice this time around to help us understand the greater spiritual message. Jesus again says to Peter, you, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. And the Lord replies, with, and, and then Peter replies, with, not just my feet, but my hands and my, my head as well. And Jesus answers, those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. So the spiritual reality that Jesus is illustrating by washing his disciples' feet is this, this continual need for the confession and the repentance of sin to happen in your life and to happen in my life. 
Foot washing represents the ongoing, we could say progressive, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, whereby He convicts of sin within our lives, and He leads us to confession, and He leads us to repentance. Repentance is a word that means I'm going to turn from that. I no longer want to do that anymore. It's life renovation, as Mark started off telling us about. The truth is, is that as uh, for you and I, as a true follower of Jesus, you've already been spiritually bathed, right? You're a believer. It's sealed. Hell can't touch you, right? The Bible says that nothing can snatch you out of his hands, and that's a done deal. And that was the justification piece. You're declared righteous. Jesus no longer sees you in your sin, or God no longer sees you in your sin because he sees Jesus who took your place on the cross, right? Justification, you're now declared holy because of that. And we're saved not by our works, we're saved because of his ultimate work that he has done. And so we're secured in his love. Notice what Titus 3 says about this idea. At one time, we too were foolish, we were disobedient, we were deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Remember that in your earlier life? We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness of love of God, our Savior, appeared... He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, right? But because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified, there's that word, right? Justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. So even though we've been declared righteous, by Jesus, even though we've been saved by his work on the cross. Some call this a positional holiness, you could say, because of the relationship that we have with Christ. This, even though those are all the, the true reality of who we are, this doesn't mean that we are now perfect, this side of heaven, does it? This doesn't mean that in a moment of your salvation that all of a sudden sin has been totally removed from our body. Wouldn't that be great? That's not the case. We are still human, and we are still in a war. We are still in a battle against sin, and that battle is daily. And if it's not for you, then you're just not breathing. It's daily. So we're all on a path towards spiritual maturity. God started this work of making us like Christ, and he is going to be faithful to continue that work. I love how the Apostle Paul phrases it in Philippians chapter 1. You and I can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God's not finished with you yet, right? God's not finished with me yet. We're a work in progress. We're constantly renovating our life to become more and more like Jesus. So this sanctification, this is the the theological word that we understand when we talk about this symbol of foot washing. It's the second object lesson that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. And so we have justification and we have sanctification. Sanctification also carries with it this idea of being set apart. That's what the word we could say means, kind of in simple layman's terms for us, is it means being set apart. It is the setting apart of believers for the purpose of which we've been sent into the world. That you and I are on a mission, that as a follower of Jesus, you've been given that mission, and you're set apart from the world to be different, to go and to move that mission out within the rest of the world. Jesus himself even says that, that he too set himself apart for God's purposes, and so we too are to follow Jesus' example and to set ourselves, to sanctify ourselves, to set ourselves apart um, for God's purposes. And in John's account of the Last Supper, he gives us, really, there, there's not a whole lot of detail that John gives us about the rest of the Last Supper. But thankfully, we have Matthew and Mark's account, and we have Matthew and Mark's details that help to give us more and more information about how the Last Supper really looked. But for John, he seems, he seems to really focus in on this foot washing piece. And that's the one piece of the, the account that John just highlights and John just grabs for us and helps us to understand. But John tells us something else, that during this last supper that, that Jesus prayed over his disciples, 
in what's called the high priestly prayer. And I think a lot of times we miss this. Um, we see this in John chapter 17. We'll refer to this in a second, but you can turn there if you want. And it seems accurate for us to say that this prayer over his disciples was at the last supper, that it was somehow around this time, around this table, that Jesus began to share his prayer with his disciples. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because, I, because if you look at the very next chapter in chapter 18, notice what it says. What John gives us the details, when he had finished praying... So we're going to read chapter 17, parts of it, in just a second. But then verse eight, chapter 18 says, When he, Jesus, had finished praying, Jesus left his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley on the other side. There was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. So he's beginning his walk to the cross. But just moments before, we, were, we, we rewind for us back in John chapter 17. Um, here, this is, the, this is the prayer for Jesus or the prayer of Jesus for his disciples, it's like the culmination of his meeting. And he decides to pray for them. By the way, you were included in that prayer. And it's this poignant reminder, I think, of his deep love, of his concern uh, that he had for his, uh, for his disciples. Knowing that he would soon be leaving them, he's committed to caring for them. He's been traveling with them in ministry now for three years, and he no doubt loves these men as he spent this time with them, and he begins to speak over them, and here's some of Jesus' words as he shares. Some of his final words he's sharing with his disciples. They've been arguing. They've been having a rough night. Jesus is using all these cool symbols to help them get it, and then Jesus kind of bursts into this prayer, and he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. He's kind of praying this to to his father, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the, of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify, there's our word, sanctification. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So Jesus is saying, just like I've been set apart to do God's purpose and God's mission, you too are to sanctify your life. You too are to work towards setting yourself apart for the greater mission that God has for us. So the symbol of foot washing reminds us that we are still sinners, right? We're saved and there's, we're, we're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's a done deal. Justification has happened, so we know that that's a done deal. But we're still sinners who still sin, and our daily sanctification is a necessary requirement for each of us who choose to follow Jesus. 1 John 1, 1.8 is this beautiful little reminder about this, and it says, if we claim to be without sin, then you're lying, is what it says. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, so if the truth is that we're still sinners, and so now if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So, symbol of foot washing, this picture of something bigger, this idea of continual cleansing, forgiveness that all believers need. And when I want to read Jesus' closing words to us in John 13, notice what he says, verses 12 through 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. He goes on, he says, I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's the, that, par that, that paragraph of verses is probably the biggest few verses for our fellowship of why we say this is something that we need to do. This twofold picture of this, this beautiful picture of the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit within our life. It's humility as you and I are to serve each other within the fellowship of, of, of the believers here. And you and I also are to be on this constant um, sanctifying um, trek towards continuing to turn from our sin and to continue to be more and more like Jesus. And now that you know these things, Jesus says, blessed are you if you do them. 
There's been some people within our church who have, have had some times to come to our communion, maybe the first time that they celebrate with us, they're a little nervous about the foot washing thing, and so they decide, I'm just going to bow out, and I'm just going to observe that one, and they observe, um, and then the next time around, they get a little more energy up, and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this, and it's not like we're breaking out the palm olive, and we're just, you know, brushing your feet, it's just, it's a symbol, right? So we're just lapping water over a foot, you know, and that's all we're doing, and so then I'll get a person who comes back the next time and they, they just say, you know, I'm going to do this because Jesus did this and because John 13 says that happy am I if I do these things. And so I'm going to do these things as this reminder of this symbol of what the greater picture of the spiritual reality of humbleness and the greater picture of the spiritual reality of God's sanctifying work in my life and his continual, present, cleansing, removal, working of sin in my life, he can do this, and so I'm going to participate in these things, and I'll get that person who'll come to me, and they'll be like, my goodness, I've never done that before, but that was so meaningful to me. We don't partake in this because I think it's a cool idea. We don't partake in this because it's, it's, it's whatever. We, we partake in this because Scripture tells us to. That's why we partake of it. So to recap, past ministry of Jesus, symbol of the bread and the cup, God granted us justification, a once and for all positional holiness that we now have because of who we are in Christ. We've, we've been declared righteous, but yet we're still sinners. We still need help. We still mess up. And now God guides us through a process of maturity, of, of practical, progressive holiness in Christ. We're becoming more and more like him. And it's a renovation of our lives to become more and more like Christ. Now these first two aspects of the threefold communion, don't worry, the last one's much, much faster. Um, but it's probably the one that should be the grandest for us, right? And that's the love feast, and that's the future ministry of Jesus, which we talk about this theological word called glorification. In the future ministry of Jesus, God will give us glorification. God will give us a permanent, ultimate holiness. And for all of those who've surrendered your life to Jesus and you've, been, you've placed your faith and trust in Him, glorification will become a final reality for you and I one day when the Lord decides to take us home, where the power and presence of sin will no longer have any effect on your life. All of this will happen. At that moment, when the Lord calls you, now, think about that for a second. It's probably the, the, the biggest, craziest thing that we could celebrate out of all three, right? When we one day get to heaven. But just think about this for a second. The sins that you and I battle as we are striving to be more like Jesus daily, and we're in that process of sanctifying our lives, right? The sins that still creep up in our lives, the sins that you tackle on an everyday basis that, that the enemy uses to speak those lies into your brain and they often trip you up. Those sins will no longer have any hold on your life whatsoever. Our bodies will be in a glorified state and sin will be no more. Just celebrate that for a moment, right? No sin no broken relationships, no more lies, no more insecurities, no more unhealthy habits, no more clogged arteries, right? No more allergies, no more depression, no more pain. Justification separates us from the penalty of sin because we've been declared righteous. God no longer sees your sin because Jesus took your place. That's justification. Sanctification separates us from the power of sin because of the Holy Spirit that now resides in your life as a follower of Jesus. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you and I can be faithful in life, right? And we can combat sin because of what the Holy Spirit does. The third piece, glorification, separates us from the presence of sin totally. So justification separates from the penalty of sin. Hell is no longer your destiny. Heaven is. Sanctification separates us from the power of sin because of the presence of the Holy Spirit working in your life to renovate your life daily. Glorification separates you from the presence of sin completely. It's no longer in your vocabulary at that point when the Lord decides to take you home or when you arrive safely in heaven. 
This last symbol of glorification, I'll just read a passage for you. It's what Scripture calls the future marriage supper of the Lamb. And I know we're nervous and we're looking at our clocks, and I apologize for that. I told Mark he should have only taken five minutes, but he didn't. Um, And he told me, you can't go 50. (laughs) I'm almost done. John writes this in Revelation 19, verse 6 through 9. Um, Just get, get this picture. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like the loud peals of thunder shouting. By the way, this happens 24-7 around God's throne. Holy, 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 right? Is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. That's his church. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to uh, her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. The love feast that we will be celebrating in just a few moments tonight, when you come back, we're going to gather around this table that's in the shape of a cross just because we think it's cool. And we're going to all gather around this table. We call that the love feast. It represents God's future work of glorification represents the promised reality of all believers when we will one day be united with Christ, as verse 7 tells us, and we will then spend eternity with him. I'm thinking this week of some of my loved ones. I think this week of Tom, a friend of ours, who had told us that he declared Jesus as his Savior, thinking of the new realities in his life that sin is no more, cancer is no more. Heart attacks are no more. Scripture refers to the church, to all of us who are believers in Jesus, that we are referred to as as the bride of Christ. And one day in the future, when Jesus calls us to gather around this grand table that I think you won't even be able to see the end of it, we will join him for what's referred to here in Revelation 19 as the wedding supper of the Lamb. And this wedding, this love feast, is a physical symbol Another symbol that Jesus gives us that we can actually touch food. We can, we can eat it, right? We can actually taste it. And it represents this tremendous promise of what Scripture tells us, that God will complete what he has begun. That the work that he started within your, within your life is continuing, and God's going to complete it one day. And our hope, although net, not yet fully realized, will one day come to fruition, and we will one day be forever with our Lord. 1 Thessalonians, my last verse I want to read to you, says, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will be the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And that is the past, present, and future ministry of Jesus in our life. And this is threefold communion. And this is why we participate it um, or celebrate it in this, in this way, because we think that participating and celebrating communion in this threefold aspect, in this format, is the best picture, the best spiritual picture that helps us to grab what these physical symbols represent. Tonight, we will all gather around the table together for a meal to help us get a bigger picture of uh, the love feast. We're going to be able to hold the, the cup and, and hold the bread, and we're going to be able to taste these symbols. And when we do that tonight, I hope that you're going to rewind in your day, and you're going to remember what we have talked about here this morning, about what each one of those symbols represent. And I don't know about you, but that is no doubt a time and something to celebrate, right? Something to celebrate. And scripture tells us that Jesus gave those symbols to his disciples as he hosted this meal to help them so they would never forget. And he says, do this in remembrance of me.